I'm with pdfdata.io. Uh, I'm not going to get into anything related to what that does. Uh, this is not a sales pitch. Um, but uh, while I'm up here, I, uh, I feel like I must take a minute to recognize how lucky I am to be here, uh, as we all are, and maybe take a moment to recognize uh, those outside these four walls that struggle to survive. Thank you. So, programming data for display. And what does this mean? Uh, to really crudely characterize what we do and what we're interested in, uh, we do computation, right? And how might you think about that? You get things coming into our world of computers uh, through all sorts of sensors and human input and machines talking to each other. Computation and communication of all sorts happen in between. And at the other end, you have some kind of output, some kind of result. Uh, and the output that I'm talking about right now is display, obviously one of the essential mediums with which we have to, to uh, uh, perceive these sorts of results. And we're all very interested in uh, a very um, uh, uh, immediate feedback from the sorts of work that we do with our computers. As you might have uh, uh, seen previously with the visualizations of the, of the keys uh, within that uh, uh, spiral characterization of, of tonality and the animations that were present there, you know, display and especially uh, animated visualization is an essential way that we have to understand uh, the data and computation that we're, that we're performing. Uh, but it wasn't always like this, where we could have huge displays and, and things twirling around on screen. All through the prior decades here, we've, of course, had a lot of different mediums for uh, uh, displaying the data and information and results of computation from telegraphs and teletypes through all sorts of dynamic displays, uh, especially during the Cold War, uh, uh, motivated a lot of this uh, development, especially through air traffic control and simulations research for vector displays, and then raster displays, which we're most familiar with in our uh, laptops and, and, and uh, projectors. But also, printing has been around, obviously, for hundreds of years. And one of, the, one of the things that so many people throughout the computer revolution were concerned about was how to distribute the results of uh, computation and, and put tools into the hands of as many people as possible so that you could have modern, uh, 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 modern equivalents to uh, uh, the, the movable type press, essentially. Um, and so fax machines, for example, were a huge uh, uh, you know, formational uh, input to PDF and all sorts of page description languages uh, that were sort of percolating around in the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, as computation power made it possible to represent the uh, uh, data and information you were working with in a computer uh, in, in ways that were richer than a teletype. Uh, and, and there's actually a, an interesting st uh, side story about how uh, CAD and CAM systems uh, go into this and how they're a particular variety of display that happens to manifest itself in three dimensions through, through lathing and, and, and other machining. And it has you know, corollary with uh, 3D printing today as well. So I said page description language uh, just a couple seconds ago. Uh, and just to sort of set some ground terms, uh, what that means is any characterization of a layout of a page that's more efficient or expressive than a simple bitmap. So if you're familiar with bitmap graphics or rasters, uh, you know that you, know, you might have a you know, 1440 by 960 whatever bitmap, and that's sufficient to describe what's on my laptop screen, perhaps. Uh, but that's obviously not sufficient uh, to describe what you can print through a high-resolution offset printer or a vector-based plotter. Uh, and so uh, there have been uh, uh, progressively more capable page description languages over the past 40 years, essentially, uh, trying to tackle this problem of how do you describe what some set of data as a result of, of computations or communications should look on a page or a screen or on a plotter uh, and other media but in a way that is independent of that medium. Uh, so uh, there are dozens and dozens of documented page description languages. You can go on Wikipedia to find references for a variety of them. Uh, these are some interesting ones I'll talk about a little bit. Um, 
and all of them are trying to characterize a page in something besides draw a pixel here, then draw a pixel here, then draw a pixel here, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously not practical even today, never mind back in 1978. So I'm going to sort of go out on a limb a little bit uh, and say that ASCII may have been one of the first page description languages. Uh, and this isn't talked about in uh, uh, the sort of uh, Wikipedia page or any of the quote unquote modern literature about page description languages because it is so primitive of a medium. Uh, but these, these first uh, 32 control characters here uh, make possible the, uh, make it possible to uh, force a output device like a teletype to render a set of data uh, in a way that is visually pleasing, uh, practically consumable, for, and, and, and so on. So for example, uh, 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 fixed width uh, tabular data like this was commonplace for centuries, uh, essentially, where you had first, uh, first um, you know, uh, lead movable type uh, 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 printing presses being used to produce tables like this for newspaper consumption and things like that, and then on to uh, uh, you know, teletype printers that produced displays of tabular data for efficient uh, uh, you know, viewing and consumption by humans in a way that we can understand this data. Uh, outside of this kind of visualization, because it is a, a, a visualization, understanding this data would be extremely laborious, right? Um, and it's only because of the control characters that were baked into ASCII, for example. There are plenty of other character sets like this. EBCDIC was sort of its main uh, competitor, competitor at the time. Uh, but it has these control characters that allow the print head uh, at the time to move forward a space, move back a space, uh, move down, run to the next sheet of paper, et cetera thereby allowing uh, an author of a program to fully control the, the materialized view, so to speak, of a set of data. Uh, and so as demands uh, uh, increased over the years and uh, uh, various considerations drove a lot of development uh, for, for more time, essentially, we got to uh, the use of uh, CRTs and vector displays for uh, real, both real time. This is actually an asteroids game that's being uh, implemented on top of a, on top of an oscilloscope. Uh, uh, but the same, exactly the same technology was used originally to implement uh, uh, air air defense systems, uh, air air traffic control systems, and uh, here, video games uh, and, and all sorts of real-time simulations like planetariums uh, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, you want to be able to display raster images. Again, these are just pixels on a screen that are resolution dependent, uh, and so they need to be included or referenced somehow within your page description language so you can produce it onto a, uh, a, a printer or other um, or, their, or other output device. And then probably the, the hardest uh, nut to crack, so to speak, in the history of page description languages is text and typography. Um, not just because of, um, not just because of, or so many factors, honestly. Uh, so, so, <clears throat> With, with, so with both vector graphics and, and rasters, uh, the, the domain is very uh, uh, well-defined and constrained, right? So if you want to draw asteroids, you know what you need to do. You need to describe that I want to draw a line here and a here, line here and a line here and a line here, et cetera, et cetera, to produce the uh, uh, you know, vector representations of your, of your asteroids and spaceship or uh, you know, nuclear missiles or whatever you happen to be doing. Uh, likewise, raster images, an artist produces these laboriously by hand, and then they need to be ferried along to whoever's going to be viewing the document. Text and typography, on the other hand, <clears throat> these are, uh, have an enduring role throughout the uh, construction of a document and through the maintenance of a document. There's this notion of fonts, which honestly didn't, uh, didn't exist prior to the more sophisticated page description languages like PostScript. Uh, and 
as you get into, if you remember the, the uh, ASCII chart there, there's a whole, only 127 uh, code points compared to, for example, Unicode today. Um, so these are, these are a lot of different challenges that uh, page description languages have to cope with and, and the history of, of the most successful one, which, is, which happens to be PDF, is sort of littered with uh, uh, the inventors of it learning along the way how to cope with these particular challenges. So just a little bit of sort of thumbnail history. Uh, there was this company called Evans & Sutherland that uh, in 1968, I believe, was founded to uh, custom produce systems uh, for real-time simulation and CAD CAM systems. So they, um, they built the projector systems in planetariums, and they also built these systems to produce uh, um, uh, very high precision mechanical components through, through uh, 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 computer-aided machinery. And the way they did that, uh, to circle back to that point about CAD and CAM, is they used an internally developed page description language where the page was the set, or, th or the operators over the so, quote-unquote page were a set of motions that a drill head or a router might make on a block of aluminum in order to produce a particular artifact. Um, it was all the same set of fundamental technologies, whether they were you know, projecting on the ceiling of a planetarium or you know, producing a cog for a machine. So a couple of fellows, Chuck Gishi, uh, or and, and, and John Warnock, uh, worked at Evans & Sutherland for some number of years, uh, and then went on in the mid-70s uh, off to Xerox Park, where they helped, in, uh, helped uh, develop all sorts of things uh, there including Interpress. Uh, Interpress was a page description language that was essentially, uh, it was essentially bytecode. So if you think of the production of a set of vector graphics, like I said, you want to put your pen down somewhere and you want to draw a line 20 coordinate points this way and 10 down, and then a, a line this way, 10 up and 12 right, and then an arc of a particular, uh, using a particular uh, set of Bezier parameters. Uh, those were all encoded using uh, uh, byte codes that were incredibly efficient and very necessary given the uh, space and computational constraints at the time. Uh, we're again talking about uh, you know 1978 or so. Um, lore is that John Warnock was very frustrated with Xerox not being able to successfully commercialize Interpress. Uh, Xerox at the time was. Uh, the behemoth in computing systems uh, at the time, at, in 1970s dollars, a, a billion dollar company uh, uh, producing uh, uh, printing systems. And they were using, they would build a new page description language for every printer that they produced. Uh, obviously, an incredibly laborious thing. Uh, and Interpress was uh, uh, John and Chuck's attempt to make an independent a, a device independent uh, 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 output medium. So that you could take the same Interpress file and send it to a plotter and a bitmap display and a laser printer, which they were, they were uh, uh, experimenting with at uh, Xerox, and have reasonable interpretations of that page description to the you know, highest degree of fidelity that each device allowed. So they were frustrated with Xerox not being able to commercialize that, and so they formed their own company called Adobe, uh, where they produced PostScript, uh, which I'll talk about more in detail in a second. Uh, PostScript ended up being baked into the first laser writer that uh, uh, Adobe and Apple essentially co-produced, and that's essentially what you know set up desktop publishing and the and the um, uh, consumerization of printing and design and publishing and all that. And it, it's, it's, I just described it in about 20 seconds, but the, but the uh, set of technical feats that were necessary are really astounding because prior to PostScript and the laser writer, I was talking about types, uh, 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 text and typography a second ago, there were you know, a set of six fonts that each computer happened to come with if you were lucky. Uh, at that time. I remember I had an Amiga back when I was a kid and it literally had five or six fonts. Uh, and they were hard-coded bitmap fonts 
you had what you had available to you and there was no such thing as going and getting a new font that would look nice in your community flyer or whatever. Uh, in the process of developing PostScript, they developed uh, uh, vector-based fonts and ways to describe those in a uh, uh, output method independent way uh, and a way to encode those for different computing platforms, including DOS and Apple IIs and the Macintosh eventually, et cetera. Uh, and then as a refinement to PostScript, and I'll talk a little bit more about PostScript again still, uh, they uh, developed PDF at Adobe. Uh, and the first version of that specification was promulgated in 1993, I believe, uh, and has been refined over time to uh, really saturate the set of use cases uh, that people have for uh, display and printing technology uh, and, and, and describing what needs to be displayed on any output device in an independent fashion. So this is papers we love. Uh, sadly, as an a accident of history, I suppose, there aren't a lot of papers uh, that, have, that were published and peer reviewed about the development of Interpress and PostScript and PDF and all the other page description languages back in those days. Uh, in part, that's because a lot of this development was driven by commercial organizations as opposed to academia. And so a lot of the information that is available about how these uh, languages and technologies came to be is uh, passed along as, as folklore, essentially. Um, and so I'm not sure who Brian Reed is, but he there's an uh, uh, extremely comprehensive history of the uh, uh, of PostScript and Interpress, and a comparison between the two uh, from 1985 on a, on a, news, group, uh, on a news group dedicated to uh, laser printers, uh, and probably 20 pages of, of solid news group text talking about the uh, very minute uh, technical differences between those and how uh, uh, PostScript represented a, a incremental but essential advance over, over uh, uh, Interpress. And, uh, if I remember, I'll, I'll touch on some of those differences. Uh, and then later in 1991, uh, as Adobe uh, started towards uh, developing PDF, uh, it's not a paper, again, uh, but it was an internal memo, essentially, within Adobe, uh, where, where John Warnock laid out the, the broad vision of what they were calling Camelot at the time, which turned into the PDF specification. And a lot of the, you can see here right in the uh, first paragraph here, talking about the, the prevalence of fax machines and the problems that uh, uh, the limitations of that technology had uh, for the people that were using it. So when you're sending a invoice or a contract or a love letter through a fax machine and it comes out as a horribly pixelated, sometimes indecipherable mess on thermal paper, that is not the kind of uh, uh, you know, replication of intent that you want to have. When you go through the trouble of printing this beautiful document, you want to be able to send it to anybody anywhere in the world and have the other person on the other side of that communication channel see exactly what you intended. Uh, and fax machines were being used widely at the time because of, you know, uh, essential business uh, uh, needs, but they didn't capture that, um, uh, that respect for the original intent of the author, essentially. Uh, and so that's, that's one, of the, one of the key uh, uh, considerations that sort of drove a lot of the feature development in, in PDF, being able to take this artifact, ship it somewhere, again, just data, not over phone lines or you know, via the, the fax infrastructure, and have that data be materialized either on a printer or somebody else's screen exactly as you could see it on, on your side of the world. So um, that's a little bit of the history and how uh, sort of from a, from a human sense how you know, uh, uh, the, the people involved in the project sort of arrived at, at PDF. Uh, and I'll talk about a couple of the uh, you know, technical characteristics of uh, both PostScript and PDF. Um, they're, they're 
further antecedents are sort of lost to memory. I'm aware of some interpress interpreters, but I've never laid my hands on one uh, directly. Um, but I have some reasonable familiarity with PostScript and too much familiarity with PDFs. Um, so PostScript is a stack-based interpreted language. Uh, this is interesting insofar as other page description languages are not fully, uh, uh, fully formed programming languages at all. They are uh, strictly declarative uh, uh, specifications that, of, of what should be drawn. And so SVG is an example of the latter where uh, uh, there, is no, there is no stack, there is no higher order programming uh, uh, facilities or abstractions within SVG. You are strictly de uh, describing what should be presented on screen or via a, a, a printed medium. PostScript, on the other hand, uh, is, a, is a, as it says, a stack-based interpreted language. And so what this means is that you have uh, a programming language semantics. You can write PostScript programs that do anything in the course of producing output suitable for a printer or uh, 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 immediate visual display device. Um, or other things. There's, there's actually a little cottage community on GitHub of people using PostScript to do all sorts of non-printing, non-display oriented, oriented things. There's tons of you know, little uh, 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 Fibonacci examples and people implementing Mandelbrot sets within PostScript that end up producing the output as, as a printed sheet, that sort of thing. So you can do anything you want in PostScript. Uh, they happen to apply it to uh, apply it to describing pages and that was its original intent. Um, and PostScript provided for a lot of essential features that its, that its predecessors didn't. For example, you can embed bitmaps within PostScript, whereas in, in other page description languages, you would send the page description and then along with it, uh, additional assets, images, headers, et cetera, that needed to be referred to using relatively fragile means like a, like a, like a file name. Uh, and so this was, this was uh, uh, ended up being problematic for things like fonts, which you couldn't bake into PostScript, I don't believe. Um, and so a, a very common thing, and we run into this today as people who are enthusiastic about academic papers, if someone happens to publish a PDF, I mean, a, a, a PostScript file, of a paper, or that's the only version that happens to be available from 20 years ago, you might download it and you don't have the font that it was originally rendered in, and your system will automatically and usually, unfortunately, choose a, a, a uh, bad alternative to render it in, and it ends up being useless. And so again, that, that goes back to one of the um, uh, failings of PostScript that uh, Adobe addressed within PDF where you could send a single contained blob across a wire and not have to worry about whether uh, that person had the bitmaps or that person had the fonts that they needed to render that document faithfully. The most interesting thing to me uh, for various reasons about PostScript is that uh, it was an interpreted language, but it wasn't interpreted on a debt like a, a general purpose computer necessarily. So you would have your computer attached to your uh, 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 laser writer, for example, in 1985, and you would send that PostScript file over the Apple Talk network or whatever you happen to be using over to that printer, and the printer would interpret, evaluate it, and render the result on each page. Uh, and so this was, this was an example of edge computing, where the edges were these devices, where every single PostScript output device had a full-fledged, you know, uh, 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 two-spec PostScript interpreter running uh, on its own hardware. Yeah. So like I said, I've been working on this for about an hour and a half or so. That's as far as I got with slides. <laughs> but. Thank you. But I have things I can show you. And someone's going to have to tell me about time, because I have no idea where I am. Uh, so first, I'm going to bring up, so this is, a, this is the Camelot project. Um, 
I wonder if it's worth trying to go to full screen here. Anyway, um, this is that Camelot Project white paper. Uh, and uh, it has some, some handy and easily digestible chunks of postscript shown here. And so part of the, you know, part, a big part of the Camelot paper is motivating the design of PDF uh, contra postscript and the challenges that it, that it has. Uh, and, and one of the essential challenges that, uh, that uh, they identified was that because each device that renders a postscript file needs to have that full-fledged interpreter, and because the language was a fully Turing complete language that had all sorts of, even today, excuse me, um, very interesting and useful features. For example, you could rebind any name at any time, anywhere. Uh, and so this, this, this might remind you of a, of a variety of dynamic programming languages that we use today uh, that, that are difficult to optimize uh, and sometimes hard to use. Uh, and at this point in time, people were still writing PostScript by hand in order to produce uh, very uh, um, intricate designs. There were, there were you know, manual PostScript typesetters, essentially, that would write PostScript to get, for example, the logo of a company just right. And they would have this chunk of PostScript that would be carried around into each of their documents that they would, that they would share around a company. Uh, and so one of their objectives was to uh, drastically simplify the language uh, or the, or the uh, set of operation, operands that were available within PDF so that it didn't have that degree of flexibility, that it didn't have that, it wasn't as powerful as, as uh, uh, PostScript was with regard to the flexibility afforded to the programmer or the program that generated it. And so here, uh, here uh, John Warnock is talking about uh, this, this PostScript file that draws a 10-sided polygon uh, that, that used, that redefines uh, this uh, ANG uh, uh, constant and then does a loop. This is, this is repeat, this, this, this repeat uh, uh, operand uh, will run this block of PostScript 10 times. And if you run through it in your head, it's producing a 10-sided uh, equilateral polygon. Um, what they wanted to do is get move one notch closer to a declarative uh, language where you say, uh, where you strictly say what should be drawn on a page or on the output device. And so rather than, rather than allowing people to uh, uh, write subroutines essentially, which is what, which is what this poly uh, ends up being, that's a subroutine within that particular file. Rather than allowing people to people and programs to do these sorts of things, uh, they essentially flattened PostScript into uh, a a language where it's still stack based and it's still interpreted, but you don't have the ability to define constants or functions, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, and you cannot rebind things like uh, uh, built-in built-in operators. And so there are you know move and draw line operations within. PDF, they're not, they're not called move to and line to. This is before PDF was built, and so it's just a, it's just a mock-up, essentially. But you, rather than having that power of the abstraction of looping and definition uh, within PostScript, you do need to write out sequentially every single uh, line, path, character, et cetera, that you might want to render within a PDF, uh, which is makes the interpreters simpler and makes them easier to optimize so that when you send a PDF over the wire to a uh, printer that could render that PDF, it didn't need to be nearly as powerful. And so they were already looking forward to you know, portable computers and, and, and much uh, uh, still more constrained environments uh, than, than what was typical in a workstation at the time. Uh, so I think that's it for PostScript. PostScript is very cool. PostScript is sort of fun to tinker around with if you're slightly masochistic. Um, can people see that? Okay, I'll bump it up one. Or a couple. Better? So, I figured, I think I've basically run through what I have, so I thought I would give 
the, a, a five minute tour of what a PDF looks like internally. I'm sure you've all opened up you know, PDFs to Notepad or whatever accidentally and seen all this garbage. Uh, but I thought I would go through it and, and, and you know, show a couple of the highlights. Um, within each PDF, each PDF document is organized as an object graph. Uh, this, is, this is interesting in a couple of different ways and actually addresses the same use cases that, uh, uh, that uh, redefining uh, uh, procedures in PostScript had in that language. So you can define each, each uh, object within a PDF can contain a set of operations, much like I just showed in the, in the Camelot paper, describing how to draw a particular shape or a, uh, how to render or what text to render at a particular point in the page, as well as sets of matrix uh, uh, operations that transform the, uh, the vector space that describes the output device in an abstract way. So uh, this makes it possible, for example, to have a single object within a PDF that describes how to draw a header in a document. And then throughout that document, each uh, page's description can simply refer to that object. And so you don't repeat all the information that's necessary in order to render that header over and over and over for a 500 page document. You can describe it once and simply refer to its object. And so uh, uh, each, each PDF contains this object table. These are all byte offsets that you see. And there's a lot of objects in this particular PDF. Uh, there we go. Each of these is a byte offset within that particular file uh, that indicates where that object begins. Uh, and so, This is one reason why, for example, you can't just edit a PDF. A lot of people say, why can't I edit a PDF? There's a lot of reasons, but one of them is that its, it's essential structure is fixed at generation time to a large extent. There are ways to add objects and mark these previously written objects as being overridden, essentially, but relatively few tools support that. Uh, and so, and that's why, that's why PDFs are generally considered to be uh, uh, immutable once they, once they leave their, their uh, point of generation. Uh, one of the huge, oops, let me just find the, I'm finding a font for you, and I'm following object references if you want, if you notice, um, here we go. So one of the big innovations of uh, PDF documents, like I was saying, was that rather than needing to ship the fonts necessary to render a PostScript file, for example, along with that PostScript file, the, you can embed, and usually they are, fonts are embedded within each PDF. Uh, except for, there's a set of 14 fonts that were originally defined as part of the Adobe spec uh, that are expected to be at every location. Uh, which is like, you know, Times and Courier and things like that. Uh, uh, th those, those basics that were available in, you know, uh, 1994 or whatever. Uh, so within each PDF document, you can embed uh, whatever font you like, as well as encodings that map uh, character codes that are used to output each character to uh, uh, that slot, essentially, within the font file. Uh, and this is where PDF documents sometimes run, run astray, where if you've ever tried to copy and paste text out of a PDF document, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, very often, the reason why it doesn't, unless it's just an image-based PDF, where it's just a bunch of bitmaps from a scan or whatever, usually why that happens is because as an optimization step, what you can do is you can take a font file that describes you know, 127 or 256 or you know, 4,000 characters, and uh, when you output the PDF, if you know you only use 36 of them, you can uh, shrink that font file, rewrite it so that character position zero in that font, instead of being null, is the letter A. And the, the uh, mapping between the character codes used within the PDF and the character codes that are uh, uh, used within the font uh, 
are described in these dictionaries here. These are mappings between characters and, in this case, uh, uh, separate objects that describe how to, how to render each character. Uh, so that's, that's one interesting side effect of, of the optimization steps that are available by dint of being able to embed any font file into a PDF. Um, I wonder if this has any images. That one doesn't. <laughs> Another interesting thing about uh, PDFs, PostScript could embed bitmaps, but they did it in a, uh, they always base 64 as far as I'm aware, they always base 64 that data so that it was, uh, so it could be transmitted over ASCII only uh, uh, conduits. PDF made no such uh, uh, constraint, and so if you open a random PDF that contains some images, you'll often, often find binary garbage floating around in it. And, and so you have, uh, uh, you know, much to the chagrin of people that write PDF tools, you have this interleaving of, of clear text descriptions that relate to the object graph within the document as well as metadata associated with each object. That's where you see this, uh, this is a subtype of image, you have a width and height for the image, you know, how many, uh, how many bits, per, uh, bits per sample uh, are, found in that image, which color space is used, et cetera, et cetera. And then the key right here, this filter uh, that uses the zip deflate algorithm. And so then as, as, a, as a parsing tool, you need to run your parser over that plain text portion and then switch to a binary, you know, slurping of that data for however far its length goes in order to obtain the bitmap that you need to render on page or, or on the screen. And Honestly, I could do this for a long time, so I won't, I'm gonna stop right there. Uh, depending on how, how time is, uh, I can do more if people care. But. Cesar. <laughs> Thank you.